a range of options to do this. One, you either look for fresh capital injection. Two, you capitalize your income surplus. That's convert your profit to capital. Or three, you combine any of these two. That's the capital injection and capitalization of income surplus. We saw in the course of the year 2018 that banks were actively doing this. Now, from what I gather, from what my sources tell me, Bank of Baroda's model, uh, its form of operations, doesn't require such a huge amount of capital. So I think it tried to speak to the regulator on, uh, let's say, a waiver. But you know the regulator is going hard on everyone saying that 400 million or nothing. So it realized that, you know what, we don't need this 400 million to run our operations. So we would voluntarily wind up our operations. And you know, we saw in the course of the year, Bank of Ghana came up with that voluntary winding down or winding up uh, directive, where if a bank wants to step out of its operations, you do it in, an, in a very orderly manner. Mm -hmm. So with regards to the word orderly, we know the regulator doesn't want any mess in the financial system. So Baroda approached Stambic Bank and Baroda, Stambic Bank, Bank of Ghana all work together to ensure that the clients that Baroda has are transferred to Stambic Bank. So going forward from today, 2nd January, all clients of Bank of Baroda become clients of Stambic Bank. Such that even if you have a Bank of Baroda check and you issue it, it's going to be cleared through Stambic's system. So it's essentially just a movement in very simple words, a movement of the clients and their funds of Bank of Baroda to Stambic Bank. Stambic Bank is not acquiring any IT systems whatsoever. They're not going to purchase their buildings or anything of that sort. Clients and their cash have been moved to Stambic Bank. Okay, okay. Um, let me go straight to the phone lines and speak with Dr. Daniel Sedo. He's a financial consultant. Um, Dr. Sedo, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning and Happy New Year. Uh, same to you, and many happy returns as well. Uh, Dr. Sedo, so this move that has been taken by the Bank of Baroda, um, we know what it means for the customers. That means that they are now moving to Stambic Bank. But for the bank itself, we know that the bank is not just made up of its deposits. What happens to uh, the Bank of Baroda now? The Bank of Baroda is simply saying they want to discontinue their business in Ghana. And they, they've made that decision because they do not see the need to put in 400 million as capital. Probably they have some better use for that money. So what they need to do is give away the things they need to do, give away. Um, it's a regulated industry, so the key thing for the central bank will be depositors. That is what they've arranged for them to be moved to stand big. So the depositors are safe. If there are other creditors, I'm sure the central bank would ensure that they are taken care of. Now, Stambic cannot assume responsibility for the depositors. That is what we call the liability. For nothing. They would have to go with some assets from Bank of Baroda. So the liabilities, which is the customers or creditors, will be moved out. The assets to match that would also be moved out to Stambic. Then effectively, any residual amount is what Bank of Baroda can take out. And that ends the uh, story in Ghana. So back to the customer's perspective, if you used to save with Bank of Baroda and you took a loan and um, you are now being transferred to Stambic Bank, we know that the two banks would have different rates, for instance, do you maintain your Bank of Baroda rates or you go and renegotiate with Stambic Bank? No, no, no. It, it will go with the existing terms. It is not you who created the, the changeover. So it will go with the existing terms. Uh, that's what I tried to explain earlier. As you go with the customers, that is depositors, equally you need to go with some assets. Those assets could be, let's say, Bank of Baroda has bought treasury bills or Bank of Baroda has given loans to people, which they would have now have to transfer to Stambic. Stambic would assume responsibility for the performance of that loan. So the rates will not change immediately. Now, they would have to assume everything as it is immediately, then build the relationship with the customers, and if they are fresh transactions, they do it with them on their terms. Now, transiting from Baroda to Stambic does not mean 
that even when you go to Stambik, you can't exit. You can exit if you are not happy with Stambik. So you go on existing terms, and afterwards you can change your mind. Okay. What does this mean for Stambik Bank making this move? Uh, Stambik is in business, uh, so there should be something good in it for them. Uh, everybody wants customers, particularly good customers. So if Bank of Baroda is offering you their good customers, you should be happy because it costs money to win customers. Uh, we just hope that the asset that they will transfer to them will be quality asset, not toxic. If they are quality asset, then Stambik uh, has got it right. I believe that it will be a transaction that will be a win-win. Uh, probably the assets that may not even be good could be negotiated or discounted. Uh, this thing has been under the supervision of the central bank. We all know what happened in recent time. And I believe everybody is paying keen attention to the things they do. So it's good news for Stambik. Okay. Um, having established that this is good news for Stambik and having established that they are just taking the deposits and the customers. What happens to the workers of Bank of Baroda? Um, since the bank is winding up, does that mean that these guys are out of a job? I, I do not know the details, but that is a, a possibility. Now, if Stambik current staff can look after the customers moving from Bank of Baroda to Stambik, then there will be no need assuming responsibility for the employees. Let's remember all these things come at a cost. So you don't want to do this and shoot your cost up for nothing. Um, it is up to us to think through some of the policy decisions. Now, the key thing and what Bank of Baroda has done is to tell all of us that probably you don't need $400 billion for everybody. Pay the books. Bank of Baroda was not a loss-making bank. It was a profitable one. They want to remain small. They want to build their portfolio over time. But the regulatory requirement is $400 million. What is the implication of their exiting? Probably people will lose their jobs. And those are the things we should be taking into consideration when making policy decisions. Okay. Okay. Uh, because I'm reading um, a section on page 4 of the directives for voluntary winding up, and it says, a liquidator shall be named in the special resolution of the board of the bank that wants to voluntarily wind up and the liquidator should have consented in writing. So we know that the parts of the board shall cease and the bank begins to liquidate, that is sell off its assets, its assets little by little. This means that Bank of Baroda will no longer exist in, in, in a while. Yes, Bank of Baroda is gone. Literally, what is their business? Their business is banking. And banking is about people bringing deposits, you making loans. That core activity they've transferred to Stanbic. So they have no business. The, the, so Bank of Baroda, it's gone. The, the good thing is that they've gone about it very well, professionally. But so, that means for the workers, yeah. Dr. Sedo, that means for yeah. the workers that these guys are, uh, for all intents and purposes, these guys are going to be jobless for now. But that's what I try to explain, that Bank of Baroda was not a loss-making bank. They decided to exit because of capital requirement. And for them, they don't need that excess capital. Now, you're going to see a situation where everybody has $400 million, and probably they have nothing to do with the $400 million. That is very possible. They think that, look, with a little capital, we've run this bank so well, we've met all our capital adequacy requirement issues, we don't need huge capital to grow the business. But the regulator says, this is my requirement. And they say, sorry, we brought our money. We want to take it back. Are there liabilities? Yes, there are liabilities. How do we settle them? This is what they settle bringing Stambik Bank in. So they finish their business. Remember, probably they also came with staff. They are going back with the staff. So we need to keep our own people. I'm just saying that we make policy decisions. But these decisions must be balanced. That, that is the reality on the ground. Okay. It must be balanced. Okay. Um, yes. So, uh, Doc, pardon me. We just wanted to have some clarity on that matter of the jobs of the workers. The customers, as you say, are being transferred to Stambik Bank. Are the workers following the money to the bank or the workers have to look for another job? 
it is a, a stamp bank is assuming responsibility for depositors. Yes. Effectively, if your money is in Baroda, if you are looking for it tomorrow, go to Stambik and you will get your money. It does not mean that workers should follow to Stambik. I explained earlier that Stambik is a big bank. Now, if they do not have need for excess additional staff, they won't take them. What should happen is Bank of Baroda should settle those workers because they are closing down the bank. If there's some exit packages they need to pay those staff, yes. But I do not think Stambik will be under any obligation to assume responsibility for the staff. If, in the scheme of things, Stambik thinks that, look, uh, Mr. Dazi or whoever is a good person they want to pick and add to their staff, they have liberty to do that. Thanks. Um, thanks for uh, that uh, clarity given, Dr. Sedo. Now to the general banking sector. Now, this has happened with Bank of Baroda. This is part of the Bank of Ghana's general um, policy, which we, you were saying is a consideration we must make when we are making policy. What does this say about the strength of the banking sector and the Ghanaian business environment in general? The, the banking sector uh, was confronted with challenges uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, the central bank decided to correct things and clean up. Uh, they're doing the cleanup. Perhaps the strategy they've adopted is to introduce a very high capital requirement. That capital requirement may be the decision that has been made to cushion whatever shock may come. Uh, the question some of us are asking is, do we have enough business? to use the 400 million for. Because remember when people put in money, the managers need to sweat that capital and generate return for the owners of capital. Do we have enough money? Now also, what went wrong before some banks ran into difficulty? Have we corrected those things? Now, it's about decision making. You've been given money. That money in itself cannot run the bank. You need to mobilize deposit. What is the cost of deposit today in Ghana? It's still very high. And so if you ask people to capitalize and the cost of deposit is still high, there will still be difficulties. If you don't get smart people, I'm talking of people who will be on top of their job to manage these entities. Now, additionally, if our economy is doing well, if the economy is growing, there are business opportunities, and if we are able to come up with with productive ventures, then banks will serve us well. But if the economy is not doing well, business is not doing well, and we are not able to come up with productive ventures, uh, there will be excess money that will come with its own challenge. So now, Dr. Sedo, we, we are having less banks in the system. Bank of Baroda was one of uh, the best performing banks. They are pulling out. What is the impact on you know, the business community, as you name, and the sector? No, Baroda was, uh, was serving a certain niche. That is the Indian community. So they expect to be on the Indian community. And it's up to Stambik to accommodate them and meet their needs. Once Stambik looks after them very well, there will be no effect. Uh, bank of Baroda is really a relatively small bank. It's not a big bank. So there wouldn't be any significant effect coming from their exit. Okay. So this is not a cause for worry? No. This, this should not worry anybody. I, I'm happy the transition is good. It's been done professionally. So there is nothing to worry about. Thank you, Dr. Daniel Sedo, for joining us You're this morning. You're welcome. He's a financial consultant. On uh, He was speaking to us on the Bank of Baroda matter. So key uh, talking points from this one. Number one, if you're a customer of Stambik Bank, that means you are of Bank of Baroda, that means you are now a customer of Stambik Bank. However, that, the terms that you were banking with Bank of Baroda on remain the same, for now at least. For Bank of Baroda, they are closing up shop and they are leaving. That means that the workers may be out of job, depending on Stambik Bank for now. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this, this, these workers are out of a job. And finally, because Bank of Baroda was a small bank serving a certain um, part of the market, this is not really going to cause any shakeups within 
uh, the business sector or the banking sector. Uh, there's also the points to be made, like um, Dr. Sedo was saying, that all of this represents that principle, uh, Raymond, that that 400 million minimum capital requirement may have been too much for some for some for some banks because they simply did not want to do um, that kind of business. But there's also the general thinking in the banking space that the more capital you have, the more your ability to withstand some risk and some shocks in this case. So if you have more money and some are getting impaired, you can withstand more shocks and we don't need people in the central bank bailing out and all of that. The thinking is also that when the central bank is making said decisions, it looks out at what point would I want to... And, and people felt that it was deliberately done in a way to make sure we sanitize and reduce to banks who can start on their own, banks with a fortitude, and that it was also to compel banks to merge and come closer mm -hmm. and make sure that they become bigger entities. So bigger entities of 20 is better than smaller entities of 35 or even more than that. That was the thing. But if the smaller parties. entities are working well, because in September 2017, mm -hmm. the non-performing loans ratio for Banco Baroda was 0.02 percent. Yeah. That means all the loans that they had given out, only 0.02 percent were in red, if and, I can say and, that. And then if you even look at the capital adequacy ratio from the third quarter of this year, mm -hmm. you see that it's in excess of what the Bank of Ghana requires. It's 105.44 Bank of Ghana requires. So it will just go to lend credence to the fact that that 400 million, even with the 120 million, look at the capital adequacy ratio. With 400 million, where would their capital adequacy ratio go? So they don't need that money. And yes, that just reinforces the point that that's why they want to pull out. That's, that's why they, they, they want to pull out. But, but let me allow Raymond to finish on his point. So, so I was mm. making the point here that, I mean, of course, and the Central Bank actually had to debate this along the line for a very long time. The claim is that they've actually scientifically determined that 400 million is the point we want to see banks that can withstand heavier shock. Mm -hmm. Banks that when they are. Pro Poor, poor, what they call it, NPLs, and also have to suffer, uh, what they call it, other shocks. They can uh, restand it and make sure they don't collapse like others have been doing. Banks that, if you will need others to trust and and bigger institutions elsewhere to put their money in there, banks can, that can establish LCs that can be trusted by institutions all over the world. That is what the justification from the Bank of Ghana was. In fact, they proceeded to say that, and they linked it to how. Some banks got their, even their alliances. They believe that it was too easy for people to roll up these 120 million. So they could not even diversify the source of the funding in a way that two or three people could just get the money and come in there. The two mm -hmm. could control the entire bank, set up directors who will go through the mill, but do not really fit and the system that you wanted to put out there. So it was very difficult to trust institutions like that. And going forward, you needed to link all of those because 400. You will need a, I mean, you need to raise the money through some means. If you don't get individuals who are rich enough to provide the money, you may have to expand to a larger grouping to get that money, and to make sure that we have a more stronger system in place. That is the justification they gave for it. As to whether this is a case, does and, and, and let's be clear, consistently. And I, I have been complaining that the banks should learn from the Bank of Baroda experience. And they consistently reference the, the Indian section and the small grouping that is serving and that it's easier getting them to pay the loans because they know their clients. They know how to engage their clients. Look, they can follow up on their clients. They have every single information they ought to know about their clients in this particular case. Because sometimes they even know them very, very well. I, I will also add this point, Raymond, to be fair. And from, from my, my, my speaking with experts in the sector, Bank of Baroda is even selective on its customers. It's yeah, not everyone right. that they even accept as a customer. So that's what they talked about, the predominant in their community that they yeah. deal with in this case. Yeah. And, so and, and so they, they know that they can trace them, they can engage them. So that was it. But you see, that's mm. not a standard for every other bank. Exactly. Every other bank doesn't have the shape and kind that the Bank of Baroda is okay. operating. And we cannot insist that they should also have the same kind. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It, assuming you're saying that, so the bank is from Nigeria, it's seven predominant Nigerian population in Ghana. Mm. It's seven special, special grouping. Let's say the other groups that mm -hmm. are happening. You can't have that happening. Of course. Then which ones will be serving the other people in the country too? Of course. So um, it's a specialized case and cannot be used as the case the general, against the uh, okay, case in against a more them. sustainable okay. way. Okay. Hope you get what I'm okay. trying to say. Okay. But it can be, Philip, and I know mm -hmm. uh, you, there's a point in your mind you want to make, but add this one for me. Okay. It, it, and we've had this conversation, you and I, a number yeah. of times about how 
and now we are running universal banks where every bank is every bank. Yeah. Every bank is a universal bank. Every bank has can take on any kind of um, yes. business. But this case could be made that maybe we could have segmented the banking sector so that banks like Bank of Baroda, who want to remain small, can can go ahead and do so. Yeah, um, Daniel, very, very valid point. But again, uh, in 2004, when Bank of Ghana came out with this universal banking license, uh, you see that... 14 years down the line, you have, let me give an example, ADB. We always hear that they say ADB should go back to its agricultural uh, focus. Even mm-hmm. if you check their financials, you realize that a high proportion of their loans still goes to agriculture. But mm-hmm. then they, obviously they diversified into retail and other things. Now, we've we've passed a time where Bank of Ghana will say, okay, you know what, we're going to go with a segmented uh, license where if you want to play in this space, you play in this space. If you want to play in that space, you play in that space. We've passed that. Now, it says 400 for everybody. If you want to play in a, in a, if you want to do the whole segmentation, then either you move from the universal banking license, you come down to savings and loans, or finance house, or microfinance tier one, tier two, tier two or tier three, etc. So now that's that's it. We there's nothing we this can do. This is where we are. Yeah, we, there's nothing we can do about it. They have agreed. The that Bank of Ghana can do something about 400. it. Well, that's that, that's a whole. And you know, prior to this, during this year, last year, I beg your pardon, <laughs> no there were a lot of discussions from bank MDs saying that you know what. Uh, especially those who are focused in the small, medium scale enterprise. Uh-huh. You know, let us focus on what we do. Uh-huh. We do it best. We don't need a 400 million, etc., etc. It, it's done. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, it's done. <laughs> We've done, done it. We've done it. So <laughs> now it's universal banking license, 400 million. You shape up or you shape out. As simple as that. Okay. Uh, that's, that's, that's what it is. You can complain. If you want to go into a niche, savings and loans is there for you. You have your 15 million, you can play around the space. They might also increase their minimum capital requirements. They're going their, to do that. Yes, in the in the months to come. If you, if you don't want that, you can go to finance house. You have a 15 million, you play in your space. So it's all up to you, the uh, owner of the business or whatever. But if you want to play in the universal bank license space, please get to a 400 million and come on board. Or the, nothing, nothing, nothing less. Forgive me. The other argument, which is equally instructive, mm-hmm. is that when we put in place our Depos- Depositors Protection Act, mm-hmm. the... The shocks, resilience, and elements that were introduced alongside this 400 million, I think it dampened it. So we put in place measures to make sure that you are resilient. In this case, even if you're operating 120 million or even 200 million, and let's be clear, this is 233% from what was previously the case. What would require that space, and we should consider growth of the economy one, the people who are depositing and the rate at which they are depositing in this case because the logical expectation is that me, the bank, when I'm doing business, I take people's money. Mm -hmm. I get some money out of that because I give loans to other people. Mm -hmm. At what rate are these things growing? Can I guarantee any bank which is doing ordinary business 400 million within the space? That's the kind of reaction and to me, it looks like it was risk overkill and attempt to make sure that they look very solid on the outside. That determined this. This but 400 you, million. Yes, when, new you put it, when you put in place a law that protects your depositors in this case, isn't that enough mitigation of a risk position for a bank? That you do not necessarily need the 400 to make and Because it sounded more to me that it was put in place proud to the law coming into force. Now, there's a law that says that I'm protecting you, the customer. And so the bank's excess costs required to protect you in the nearest future may not necessarily be the case and you need it immediately. At least when we are looking at 400 million in this particular case. Especially when it was local banks that complained. And there's a history to this. The history of people feeling that sections of the economy are very predominated by foreigners in ways that yeah. make sense. Yeah, which is so, why probably we are investing in... So, so we could have indeed merged the two and still come out to the figure that sounded reasonable to the guy operating who could easily grow in the next 20, 50, 60 years to become a big operator and not necessarily have the 400 million immediately. Okay. Um, I- I'm going to read this final comment on this Bank of Baroda matter mm-hmm. and then I'll introduce, we'll use the next five or so minutes to wrap up on the general minimum capital requirements conversation before we move on. Um, remember, we are going to be giving out today too. We are going to be giving out free Joy FM t-shirts, uh, Joy FM branded t-shirts. So stay tuned for um, that. Now, the Bank of Baroda came to Ghana just at the time the Indians funded the construction of Jubilee House. They were created as a vehicle for the payment of contractors on the project because the Jubilee House was funded by the Indians. 
So that's how the money was coming down to pay the contractors working on Jubilee House. Now, thereafter, they noticed there was a significant number of Indians in Ghana. So he mentioned the name of a number of companies, um, a number of Indian-owned farms and what have you. They decided to bank with Bank of Baroda. So they saved the niche. Basically, they came in to pay contractors with Indian money. And then they decided that there were, what, uh, there were a number of Indian companies here that they wanted to serve. Now, while they save a niche, they are technically a bank for trade finance. That's why they are not strong in the retail banking sector. Okay. So when, when we say um, trade finance, okay. So while they need the 400 million, Ghana is not a big strategic market for them. This is what I wanted to come in. This, yeah. this is what I wanted to come to. Uh-huh. Okay. This is what I wanted to come to. Bank of Baroda, if you look on their website, they have like 5,200 branches worldwide. They are not a small bank. They are major. They are called yeah. India's International Bank. They are a major player there. Now, if someone is going to place 400 million CDs in Ghana, for instance, UBA received money from UBA PLC, the group, uh, to, to capitalize. Mm-hmm. That means that UBA is investing in the country. Zenith Bank also received money and invested. That means that Zenith Bank is investing in Ghana. They look at Ghana and they say, Ghana is a place that we know we can make money from and we, we should do business in. So if Bank of Baroda has decided to move out, is that sort of a vote of no confidence in our economy? I don't think uh, I don't think it's it's a vote of no confidence. Uh, sh- surely we don't have the benefit of engaging with the Bank of Baroda um, guys, if you can put it like that. Mm-hmm. But I'm sure it will be part of a strategy because we've seen uh, similar moves in other parts of the world. But again, it just goes back to what they were doing in the country and having to put such a large amount of money into capital where you feel like your operations don't need it. From a business perspective, coming from the shareholders of the bank, I don't think they wanted to play in such a space because you're going to put this money there. And we've seen from the numbers already, their capital adequacy ratio. And in fact, all their fundamentals, the World Bank of Ghana calls financial soundness indicators, FSIs, they were all on the up and up. So... Good bank, strong bank. It's not because of weaknesses. That's why they're leaving. I'm no, sure I'm not talking be. about weaknesses yeah. within the bank. I'm talking about, you know, a, a, a general, country. yes, a general so impression on the point, kind of yeah. business that see, we do in the country. Because point. then what some would see it as an opportunity yes, to invest in the I country. Why would I put 400 million, million in there? Which people am I going to give the money to? What business are they going to do with it? What yes. am I going to get from there? Exactly. That's an important part. How much can the Ghanaian economy absorb from this 400 million that I'm supposed to invest in there? Compared to, let's say, taking it to South Africa. Or any of those other economies that have shown great success, there are so much money in there and all of that. And there are things to do with the money. Because, look, for instance, Bank of Baroda has been yeah. around since 2007, 2008. Mm-hmm. They have stayed within that small Indian space of how come... And, of course, they are not here. So we, they can't answer these questions for us. And realistically speaking, these guys, we've been pushed, we've been chasing them since we heard of these stories. They, they, they have not been speaking to us. Okay. How, why, why have they not seen any profit in any other sector of our economy beyond where the Indians play? Daniel, this is, this is a difficult question. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you see what I'm we talking would, about. We, we'd have to do some crystal ball gazing and then some clairvoyance here delving no, into the but, minds of them. No, no, but, but I think we can admit something that, yeah. you see, sometimes, let's be clear, our economy is not diversified as we think or sometimes want to believe it is in the ca- first place. It is not. How many of the big businesses are actually going into the banks, taking huge amounts of money to do their business. Yeah. How many? So, so that's what you should be looking at. So and those asking, big businesses that yeah. go, look at what Fina Trade did to the banking sector <laughs> a few years ago. Yeah, <laughs> true. Go, they went to borrow from everywhere. They practically collapsed. Look, Royal Banks, all of, almost all of Royal Banks' problems started with Fina Trade. Uh, okay. Anyway, so it's 11 minutes past 8 on the Super Morning Show on Joy 99.7 FM. Key takeaways from the conversation that we've had from Dr. Daniel Sedor and with Philip and Raymond here in the studio. Number one. So I think the first thing, if you're a customer of Bank of Baroda, you were a customer, you are now a customer of Stanbic Bank. Number two, if you are not a customer of Bank of Baroda and you are worried about the financial sector because of this, there's no cause for worry. One, Bank of Baroda was playing in a very small space. They were a very good, solid bank. Indeed. We I'm looking at their financial statements from September 2018. I'll admit to you, it's not everything here that I understand. But there's um, the major... The key financial... The key financial soundness indicators are, are, are doing very, very, very well. All the, Because what I did was that I compared the reasons why the seven banks collapsed 
those same numbers and I compared them to the numbers here in the in the in the in the financials of of Bank of Baroda mm -hmm. and these ones are flying. Mm -hmm. Where UBA was looking at negative, these guys are looking at more than a hundred percent. Where Unibank? Unibank. Yes. Sorry, hey, UBA people. I'm sorry, you guys are doing very well. <laughs> where Unibank was doing negative, um, Bank of Baroda is flying above a hundred percent. So this bank was doing well. There's no cause for worry. The only, I think the only dark spot on this will be the workers of Bank of Baroda, who, in truth, were not that many. Because uh, information we have is that Bank of Baroda just had about two branches. Three branches. Right? I think three at, branches. Uh, I, there was one at Abraka, there was Kumasi, I think there was Tema. Yes. If you, if you check their website. Yeah. Yes, yes. So just, it's, just three, it's just three branches. So, uh, well, for, for someone who is losing a job, it's, it means a lot. But I mean, compared to capital and unibank and all of these other banks um it's quite a smaller number we are hoping that they can be placed um very very quickly in other financial institutions considering the fact that their bank was doing well that means that i mean they were those workers were doing no, something but, right. so sorry but they have to compete with other people too there are people who are also out of jobs from these other banks, banks who are yeah. looking for jobs but they, and we, again, we, we cannot realistically say that speaking Raymond, because their banks have actually collapsed they were also not doing as no, well no no realistically speaking yes. Raymond, we had workers of capital bank tell us that because they had worked as capital bank they can't find banking jobs but if I used to work as Bank of Baroda and I came to tell that, look, my bank was doing so tremendously well. At least my bargaining, my bargaining point, power yes. is yeah. higher. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're going to take these important messages. When we come back, we are going to begin with you. Our conversation on goal setting, we are going to begin with you. What are your resolutions for 2019? What are the things that you are looking forward to achieve in 2019? And uh, we'll take your thoughts my first 10 callers will get Joy FM branded T-shirts. Good morning to you, Nanefwa uh, Roxon of Glyco Group. You want a ladies Joy FM branded T-shirt. Uh, we'll try and work something out. Um, but call us, call us, call us. Uh, tell us, share with us what your resolutions are. Dr. Jeff Bassi will be joining us in studio. Doris Ahiati would also be joining us here in studio for us to shape all our resolutions so well. This is the Super Morning Show. Stay with us. I wake up in the morning, it's a new day. And I got 